Things got a little too close for comfort this week against the Colts, but thankfully the Packers pulled off yet another home opener win. We got a lot of nice things to say about Green Bay's running game, Malik Willis's performance, and the defense stepping up in a big way. As always, we have plenty of feedback from all of you and plenty more great discussion coming up on your Packers Fan Podcast. Welcome back and go pack, go to you and yours. Podcasting since 2005, I'm Wayne Henderson and I'm working on sanitizing this game ball from Sunday's game. I can't tell what a couple of these little specks are, but wow. Gross. I saw that clip afterwards. I'm Scott Clark with the Gaming Outsider Podcast, and I have to say, I'm very impressed with how this week turned out. The Packers may have not had the most difficult team on their schedule for week two, but they stayed strong and pulled out a win at home. And it is true, this 14th season of the show brings us up to another milestone, 300 editions of Packers Talk. On this 300th episode of the PFP, we will cover the solid win over the Indianapolis Colts at Lambeau Field. As always, we'll have insightful feedback from the PFP listeners as well. And I wish I was wearing a Sparta hat for the 300. But uh, looking ahead, we'll preview the Packers road game coming up against the Titans down in Nashville. And Scott will bring his keys to a Packers victory. In fact... Scott, you'll be bringing your keys to victory with you to the game, yes? That is correct. I will be in Nashville this weekend at the game, going out there with Mr. Dan Dyler, looking forward to it. It's going to be a hot one, but uh, Packers football nonetheless. Well, let's go ahead and jump into this week. Before we get into the highlights, did you know, Wayne, this was Green Bay's 800th win of all time. They are the first team to reach that milestone that puts their total record at 800 wins, 599 losses, and 38 ties. The next closest team is the Chicago Bears, who, as of Sunday afternoon, have a total of 794 wins, which I think still holds true because they did not win this game. So That's too bad. 800 wins, man. Only team to have that. I think it's pretty awesome. It is. I mean, the fact with the history and everything i'm actually almost as surprised that we have 38 ties wow yeah that's just crazy that there's i feel like we have i don't remember there being a tie from the packers in a long time i don't i'm sure someone's gonna stat check me now and we're gonna have a call in next week oh scott the next the last tie was this date please do it please do it Uh, Let's get to the Packers leaders in the Packers Colts game. First off, on the passing side, obviously Malik Willis filling in for Jordan Love, who is out uh, with that injured, uh, is it MCL? Yes. MCL now officially. Uh, Who saw this coming? A passer rating of 126.8. Now, granted, he didn't do a lot of passing because they stuck to my keys of victory and, uh, you know, ran the ball as much as possible, but still 12 out of 14 for 122 yards, one touchdown and zero interceptions. Not too shabby, not too shabby. Rushing the leader was Josh Jacobs with 21 carries and 151 yards, his longest being 34 yards. And on the receiving end, boy, that ball was spread out those, uh, those 12 different times. But uh, Romeo Dobbs wound up being the leader with three catches for 62 yards, uh, no touchdowns, but still uh, very vital in terms of yardage there. And on the defensive side, once again, Quay Walker, six tackles, this time all of them on his very own. He's a busy man, and it was good to see. Yeah, this was a very pleasant surprise. Not all of it pleasant, but uh, for the most part, like on our opening offensive drive, you know, as expected, without Jordan Love there, we ran the ball on all but two plays but destroyed ourselves with penalties. We kept getting first downs just totally erased by silly mistakes. Kind of kept working, though, at least until we got deeper into Colts territory, had to settle for a field goal. But Narvison puts it through again, giving us the early lead of three to nothing. I was feeling very, actually, the most excited I've been to be three nothing in a long time. Yeah, right. (laughs) Uh, And then the opening defensive drive was uh, even better. Three and out, thanks to some great awareness by McDuffie. Gave the Packers the ball back on their own 20 or so. So uh, first two drives, you know, can't ask for too much better with a team this young and with a quarterback as inexperienced as Willis is. So uh, can't, can't complain too much there. No, and the very next drive still was outstanding. We literally marched all the way down the field. Jacobs huge on this drive. I'm like, we're going to run him till his legs fall off. 
We <laughs> refuse to let the penalties keep us out of the end zone this time. Malik Willis throws his first career touchdown pass in the pros to Dontavian Wicks to extend the Packers lead to 10 nothing, and kind of unrelated to any particular drive. I also want to give quick kudos to punter Daniel Whalen because he had some killer punts on the day, and I did not want to forget to bring that up. For sure. The very next drive, Packers get a turnover. McKinney intercepts Richardson after two first downs. This put the Packers around uh, the Indy 30-yard line. So, uh, man, turnovers have been have been key this season already. And doesn't it seem like we're, we're almost already getting our money's worth out of Xavier McKinney and Josh Jacobs? Oh, totally. And I'm, I'm here for it. I know Josh Jacobs was a, a lot of people were very excited about that. I wasn't as excited because I was still on the A.J. Dillon train, but the, right. after he got injured, I was like, thank goodness we got Jacobs because uh, the running game is still very much a thing in Green Bay, and I love it. And then we stopped a fourth down conversion in the third quarter. Indianapolis went for it on their own 45-yard line with about four yards to go. Their receiver dropped the pass, but Green Bay was still in position to stop him before the sticks, even if he had caught it. That gave us pretty good field position to start our drive on, which led to another field goal, extending the lead to 13-0. to zero. So I was feeling pretty good at oh, this point. Yeah. Like, very pleasantly surprised. So that was that was really cool. Uh, towards the beginning of the fourth quarter, uh, the Packers held the Colts to a field goal attempt. It looked like Indy was really starting to drive mm -hmm. after finally scoring for the first time. The Packers stopped him on third and short, which was a huge stop. Matt Gay missed the 50-yard field goal, keeping the game at that point at 13-3. to And it also gave Green Bay great field position. So that was an awesome drive as well. And I feel bad for anybody's injuries, but I don't think Matt Gay should have been out there trying to kick those long field goals on this day because he's still recovering. Uh, but they're, they're just like, oh, go out there. You got this. Yeah, Thankfully, no, he, don't. he didn't. <laughs> yeah. Later on, an absolutely gorgeous catch by Romeo Dobbs in the fourth quarter. It was kind of a dangerous throw. Could have been intercepted. But Willis owes Dobbs a beer after that 40-yard grab, putting the Packers into scoring position, leading to yet another field goal. We were leading the game 16-3, to three, and yeah, it's like, wow. It felt like it should have been like 28-3 to three at that point. It really did. There was a, there was a mishap that we're going to talk about right on the goal line uh, that uh, you know we should have been up by a lot more. But it was really cool to see Willis so excited. Uh, there, there was a shot of him like beating the top of his helmet with alternating hands yeah, yeah. and just this big smile on his face that just kind of stood out to me. I mean, I, I've... I feel like I've already got accustomed to Jordan Love's no emotion face. <laughs> so seeing a quarterback getting all excited was was kind of cool. Don't get me wrong. I love the focus that Jordan Love has. And I feel like what he's doing is somewhat intentional because he doesn't want to, you know, do what Rodgers did, like with the staring at the, I saw a meme that said, why does uh, Aaron Rodgers always, whenever he makes a mistake, stare at the camera like he's on an episode of The Office? And I was like, that is so true. So, so great. Uh, so, yeah, I, I love seeing the emotion from, uh, from Willis. That was pretty awesome. Uh, the Colts' next drive, Richardson throws another pick. There was just over 10 minutes left in the game. The Colts appeared to be driving at this time. So that interception by uh, Wilson at the 25-yard line, I questioned myself as to whether or not this was the dagger at the time. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't because Narvison missed a field goal that would have extended Green Bay's lead to 16. Uh, still not sold on Narvison. He's missed two pretty important ones. Um, you know, again, he's I believe he's a rookie, so um, you know he's gonna he's not gonna be perfect. But we've been spoiled for so long with the likes of Mason Crosby, and you know even before that. So uh, hopefully he gets that ironed out. But uh, the 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 lead was still sixteen to three at this point. Just really would have liked nineteen to three. Yeah, the percentage of misses is a little high. But like you said, you know, back in the day of Ryan Longwell, as well as they can't make them all. And at this point, I'm not going to get too frustrated with a kicker that misses this percentage. I wish it was higher. We just need more touchdowns. Yeah, that'll, <laughs> that'll solve it. <laughs> that will solve it. Uh, the dagger turned out to be the final play of the game. Indianapolis looked like they were going to pull off a miracle drive, a Hail Mary, which I was thinking this would be terrible if this succeeds in Aaron Rodgers in Detroit fashion. Yeah, Thankful. that's what I was thinking too. It, it was not looking good for a couple seconds, but it was intercepted by Williams. 
and this was the third pick of the game by the Packers. You know, last season we had a total of seven interceptions, and we're already at what uh, four, five? <laughs> yeah, three this game, and yeah, at I, least we one had last two time. last week, maybe just one. So four. You know, we're much like Bon Jovi, Scott. We're we're already halfway there to uh, <laughs> passing up last year's, but. There were some lowlights because after earlier in the game, after the interception in their favor, they turned the ball over in the end zone. The drive was looking great up until this point. Jacobs fumbled the ball into the end zone, although I personally give the credit to the Colts for doing an excellent job of punching the ball out. Even for Josh Jacobs, it's got to be a tall order to try to hang on to that ball when it's punched out like that. Indianapolis yeah. recovered it. I don't know why the ball always bounces away from us. It gave them the ball on their own 20-yard line. But thanks to some penalties against Indianapolis, the Colts were forced to punt, giving the Packers the ball back, dodging a bullet of sorts on their own 16-yard line or so. But it doesn't get much closer to being a touchdown than that. Right. But I, I got to give – you're giving kudos to the Colts, which sounds weird coming out of your mouth. Um, but uh, you're, you're right. But I got to give kudos to the Packers here, too, because they just refused to let this kind of stuff deflate them. Right. You know, it could have been very easy to let them march up and down the field, but uh, they were able to turn it around, force that punt, uh, and get them back into the game. And, and uh, I'm not going to say no harm, no foul, because we definitely missed out on the potentially seven points there. But still, they yeah. stuck with it and, and didn't, didn't give up. So. And much like the messenger said in the 300, this is blasphemy. This is madness. No, this is Sparta. <laughs> <laughs> I got, I'm not going to scream it. Why uh, Why at the end of the first half was there no hurry up? This drove me crazy. I mean, I get the better safe than sorry man, you know, mentality right. here, but yeah. you know, we, we were third and short with you know a minute left in the game, a full minute to go. Three timeouts available, didn't even use a single one, just let the clock time out and went to the locker room to give the Colts the ball at the start of the second half. This was bizarre to me. I Like, three timeouts, a full minute? You could at least get in field goal range. Um, I, it, it's so bizarre because last week, if you remember, we burned a timeout on the opening drive. Oh, I remember. And then, like, we're out of timeouts with 10 minutes left in the half. Here we've got three of them, and we're not even using a single one to try it. To give Narvison a chance to redeem him? I don't know. I, I did not understand this decision. It just felt like they were scrambling too much maybe and said, you know what, we're just going to call it a day and, and and regroup. But I don't know. That's possibly what it was. We may never know, Scott. Yeah. I just hope we don't do it again, especially once Jordan Love is able to be back. Then I right. think it's all cylinders firing. Now, we did allow the Colts to get into the end zone inside the two-minute warning of the fourth quarter, which is frustrating enough because the Colts, they refused to give up, much like we refused to give up, even with penalties working against them as well. Richardson kept the drive alive on fourth and 11 by scrambling just past the first down marker, wound up with the ball in the end zone to tighten the lead. Uh, the Packers were ahead 16-10, to 10, and I'm thinking, you know, that's only six points. I would prefer to be up by at least eight, but... Mm-hmm. Whew. Things wound up in our favor. And wasn't it nice this week to see no slipping and sliding on the yes. grass? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, on, on good old real grass, you know, football at, grass. At Lambeau Field, even if it was the same kind of grass down in Brazil, supposedly, there's no yeah. place like home. Lambeau looked great. It was homecoming weekend, and, uh, you know, all sorts of former Packers were there. It was good to see. So... With that in mind, there was so much goodness from this game, which is not what we thought we would be looking at when it was the day after Jordan Love's injury. So, Packers fans, what were you most impressed by in our home opener victory over the Colts? Was it the coaching? Was it Josh Jacobs? Was it Malik Willis? Was it our defense? And yes, you have to pick just one. Boy, I had to think about this one a little bit. The easy answer to me is Josh Jacobs just because he was pivotal to the scoring drives in this. There's no way that we could we would have gotten the end zone without his running. But I'm as little as he got a chance to throw the ball, I'm shockingly impressed with Malik Willis. He did a solid job. He didn't try to, you know, do anything crazy. He scrambled really well. Uh, he was consistent. Twelve out of fourteen. That's I, again, he didn't throw it a lot. 
but the times he did, that's a pretty high percentage. Uh, you know, even if Jordan Love is still our guy, it feels really nice to know that we've got this guy in our back pocket. It just felt like maybe he was in the wrong place in Tennessee, and he just found a, a groove here in Green Bay. And uh, welcome to Green Bay, sir. That's all I'm going to say. It's almost like Gutekunst knows what he's doing sometimes. Yeah, everybody looks like crap on that guy, right? But, you know, then <laughs> stuff like this happens, and it's like, oh, okay, all we're, right. We're on a roll. And I, I'm going to go the same way because um, – I was expecting Josh Jacobs to be amazing. Maybe not this amazing, but yeah. he was as expected, as advertised. But Malik Willis, very surprising. And the votes, they were pretty lopsided between Facebook and Twitter. But you combine them, and we came out with Josh Jacobs with 40% of the votes. And then 29% to Malik Willis. 23% of the voters said they were most impressed by the coaching and 8% went with our defense. I'm surprised defense is that low, honestly, because, man, three interceptions and some pivotal third down stops and forced punts. The defense did a solid job. I feel like they're kind of getting overshadowed by how good the offense was because I feel like we were all paying attention to the offense more because of the absence of Jordan Love. You know, so, uh, you know, <laughs> this early in past seasons, we had been complaining quite a bit about the defense. You know, between this week and last week, they're off to a good start. I just hope that keeps up. We got some uh, comments on the poll in the Packers Fan Podcast Facebook group. First off, Janelle says, Willis did a good job with what he was able or allowed to do. I'm glad they let him throw some because he has some good ones. Still, can't wait for love to be back, though. I'm so with you. So say we all. And Dan <laughs> yeah. Dyler says, I was frustrated by the second half. And remember, he was at the game. He says, I know there was a game plan but from what it looked like, that game plan was to get a lead and then just coast to the end of the game on fumes, hoping for a win. From the stands, the second half was pure garbage. There's wow. zero reason to run Jacobs 32 times. It's the second game of the season, and they, and they want to treat him like a one and done? Not a fan. Uh, I disagree with Dan. I usually don't. But I think that they that this was the smart call. This is what I asked him to do last week, right? Run the ball, give him a few chances, don't expect super great things from him, don't want to overuse him. We're not the Bears, man. We don't take a, a quarterback and put him out there and expect him to be the next best, greatest thing. Lead him into it a little bit. If he plays next week, give him a little bit more. Give him a little bit more. Uh, I, I think that they made, this was the right call. I don't, I, I'm with you on the coasting in the second quarter. Packers have, have been known to do that in the past too. You know, <laughs> get, a, get a nice lead and then just kind of, Take a break? No, 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 no. 110% all the time. I'm with you on that. But uh, I still think using the running game more was was a better call here. Anyway, if you'd like to do some comments, you can be part of the Packers Fan Podcast Facebook community and be part of that conversation at PackersCommunity.com. Check out all the fun, especially for our live game chat section. I shared, a uh, I shared a post of one of Reggie White's most amazing sacks ever, and I know Wayne loved that sack was against the Vikings. It was, it just popped up in my feed, and I was like, I got to share this because <laughs> he he projectile flung a defender, like didn't block him, kind of like picked him up with two hands and and like hurled him out of the way to get to Warm Moon. It was it was it was awesome. Also, Joe Christensen posted an interesting question in the group this morning. He says, should LaFleur, after Love returns, put Willis in for one series every game just to keep Willis' game ready if Love ever gets hurt in the future? I think the first possession of the second half, which would really disrupt the other team's planning, and then in su subsequent games just randomly after a kickoff. I think I would love... I would trust Love to make up for any issues, but it would also make me feel better to know we can trust our backup. Might even keep him in Green Bay longer. But I am aware of the counterpoint regarding training somebody to be picked up by another team. Still would be a stronger trade. Thoughts? What do you think, Wayne? That one threw me for a loop when I saw Joe post that. And I there's pros and cons on both sides of it. But what's most interesting is there's already been some good conversation in the comments to Joe's post in the uh, community group. Yeah. Uh, personally, I I like the idea of keeping him warm, but I like keeping him warm on the sidelines, out of sight, out of mind kind of thing. Uh, that's what they've done. It, you know, they never had Rodgers playing series here and there after kickoffs and stuff, you know, back under Favre. You know, uh, Jordan Love didn't do that under Rodgers. I think what they're doing is, is, is working solid, and if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But that is my personal opinion. 
That's what I think. There you go. And, you know, back then, Favre was close to his peak. He probably wouldn't allow it to happen. And then near the end of the time with Rodgers, he wouldn't have allowed it to happen. Perhaps, you know, before we get, obviously, if we get up by 25 points, they're going to take Jordan Love out. But maybe when we get up by 17 points near the end of the game. Uh, There's so much consistency to get used to. You know what right. I mean? Uh, you know, even though they're both the, the same position, they each have different styles. They have different ways that they, you know, are calling things on the on the line and directing and scrambling and and you know the defense or the offensive line and the receivers are 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 used to each of those. Uh, the Packers did a good job. It, it appeared so anyway that they spent the week working that and getting into a groove with Willis, and it worked. I think grooves are grooves for a reason. And sticking with one makes more sense than uh, than switching it up. You know, we switch things up enough with all the different receivers we throw to. I think that's enough of switch up, and you can do plenty with with uh, Malik Willis. Uh, you know, outside of games. And there you have it. Also in the Facebook group, Dan Dyler shared some photos of some cool keepsakes that he got from his recent private tour, almost private tour of Lambeau Field and the press box. I can't even describe them. You just got to go. Uh, Look for those in the Facebook group at PackersCommunity.com. And now, sound off, Packers fans. Let your voice be heard and be part of the show. Recording your voice on your phone or computer, email that feedback into us at feedback at PackersFanPodcast.com. Or you can call us right after the game on the PFP voicemail at plus one nine two zero three pack go in addition to your thoughts about the Titans and Packers game, we also invite your wager of fun score predictions for the Week 4 matchup when the Packers host the Vikings. That is gearing up to be a very important game. Deadline for your calls on that will be Mondays at 6 p.m. Central, so please make sure you get those in. What is our first voicemail, Wayne? Hey, guys. Jay Walters from SoCal. Well, good game. Uh, didn't expect to be that stressed at the end. I thought it would play out about this score level, but... I expected there to be little or no score by halftime and us to pick it up in the end. And they started so strong at the third quarter. I thought, ah, this is a piece of cake. And they drove down for that last field goal. But then again, a critical missed field goal ends up almost costing us. I mean, it was stressed down to the wire there for a minute. But all in all, I mean, you know, for not knowing the playbook, not even being there three weeks ago, uh, Malik did a really good job, I thought. And if he can just keep that up, uh, we should have no problem against Tennessee. And hopefully we get Jordan back in time for the Vikings. Anyway, um, as as always, go Pack Go. Go Pack Go indeed, Jay. Thank you so much for the call. Uh, I, I like the optimism. You know, shouldn't have a problem against Tennessee. Uh, but I think it's a it's a much more even matchup than we are uh than we are giving it credit. I think that this is uh I think the Colts game was a much easier trip than this will be. So especially being on the road. Um, but yeah, I'm with you. I did not expect to be as stressed by the end of this game, especially <laughs> when we were up by that much at the beginning. I was like, all right, I can kind of relax a little bit. Unfortunately, the Packers felt the same way and it wound up being uh, you know, heart attack pack at the end. But hey, W is a W. We will take it. We're gonna take it with us on the road. Go Pack Go. What a game stressful you know we pulled out a win that's what matters this is megan calling also sweet that dan dyler was at that game that's awesome do you have plans to be at the game versus houston because i'll be there and if so we should meet up anyway so i was obviously very impressed with the run game especially the first half just incredible i know there were reasons for that probably take some pressure off Malik, but I'll get to him later. Anyways, so um, props to the O-line, too, for making way for that and good blocking and everything like that by Tucker Craft, the silent silent hero. And it was really cool to see Marshawn Lloyd get his first run of his career. Jacobs just looked powerful, like incredible. I feel like he probably slept really well last night. He, we didn't really see a whole lot of him in the first week, so it was really cool to see him just break out and run all over the field, all over indie defense. It was beautiful. Let's see. Oh, 
Okay, the touchdown to Wicks was awesome. I, I mean, it was beautiful by him, but also just amazing for Malik to get that first touchdown of his career. I don't know if anyone watches post-game pressers, but listening to him talk, he's so, like, humble and even-keeled and just, like, super grateful for the opportunity. And he kind of reminds me of Jordan. It just doesn't seem like he gets too high, too low. He just comes there, does his job. But honestly, to learn the playbook and, like, as much as he did and execute the way that he did after just a few weeks on the team is incredible. And hopefully Jordan can like get fully, fully rested and healed up versus rushing back. Now that they have some more confidence in what Malik can bring as a backup. Cause I was thinking they might try to like really rush Jordan back and then it would be too soon. And then the injury would come back later in the season. So that is great. That is great. McKinney, totally on a roll. I hope he gets a pick every game of the season. Just awesome. Picks in general, the fact that we had three, the fact that we've had five already by week two, it's amazing. Our defense is looking really good. I mean, honestly, our defense is looking really good. Let's see. Not even just the big plays, like Wyatt Sack, the interceptions, all three of them, everything like that. Those are like huge plays, but like the consistent pressure every down and just like preventing them from ever really making any progress moving down the field for most of the game was, was really great. Let's see. What else do I have? Oh, I did find it hilarious. I don't know if anyone else noticed that the announcers described the indie offense as anemic. And I just <laughs> thought that was really funny. Also, like, did anyone hear or did anyone see Josh Myers puke on the ball, but then like to hear Matt talk about when he asked Malik why he didn't throw the ball because Josh had just puked on it. I just thought that was so funny. Um, Matt was super happy after the game. Love to see him like that. Can he just win coach of the year? It's like been four years coming and he's always overlooked and he just deserves it. I just love him. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, Romeo caught at the, at the start of the fourth. He caught a, a ball from Malik and he smiled huge. And I feel like usually he really contains his emotions and he like couldn't contain the smile. I thought that was awesome. Ending was stressful for sure. I know we had like a few missed opportunities. Like it should have been a higher score for the Packers like before that point so that we wouldn't have had to worry as much. But it is what it is. We got the W. It was really awesome to watch Malik's confidence grow like with every throw and every down throughout the game. It was pretty cool. Very, very excited for what's to come for this team. It was totally a joint team effort. Every aspect, every side of the ball just played great. So let's see. Bring on Tennessee next week and go, Pat, go. Green and gold till I'm dead and cold. Let's go. Oh, yeah, Megan. Let's go. Loyal to the soil. And yeah, after we win the Super Bowl this year, Matt LaFleur should be a lock for Coach of the Year. Great points about Josh Jacobs and getting a good night's sleep and uh, Malik's first touchdown. Yeah, we definitely do not want to rush Jordan Love's return in any way, shape, or form. They keep mm-hmm. saying that he's like ahead of schedule, but kid gloves, right? Yeah, just take your time, man. Take your time. Quality counts. And I agree 100%, Megan. An interception by Xavier McKinney every single week this season, I'm on board. I'm going to watch for it. (laughs) And our center, Josh Jacobs, inventing vomit ball. I did not see this happen. I had no idea this happened at all until I saw the clip uh, that I I forgive me, whoever posted it in our Facebook group. I did not write down your name. Uh, That was hilarious. And and LaFleur's reaction to telling that story was just kind of, adorable i don't know it was just a really great storytelling on that i thought that was awesome yeah it's just one of those things and you know props to malik for just hanging on to the ball and running with it yeah he knew somebody yeah. had to touch it it's gonna be hey, him. could you imagine trying to throw a football covered in puke i mean he still carried it right could have still carried it but it, like it would be slippery he didn't he didn't <laughs> want to make the receiver suffer with it he took care of it himself. and Well, I think it was more about him him not throwing it accurately. 
Oh, you, know? you think that's why? I think it was because he didn't want the receiver. To no, have to I don't it. think a quarterback cares what what happens to a receiver's hands. It's about what's going to be best <laughs> for the play. And if he's got you know some substance on there that's not going to make him throw it like normal, then yeah. Like, well, could we not have used a timeout there? I don't know. <laughs> like, if he if he's throwing up, does he need a break anyway? Like, <laughs> let's talk about that for a minute. It was a warm day at Lambeau Field. Yeah. Immortals, yeah. we put their names to the test out there on the <laughs> field. And Megan, you're going to be attending the Texans at Packers game. That is awesome to hear. She's hoping somebody else in the area will go and uh, can do a little meetup. That calls for a Go Pack Go, Scott. Go Pack Go, indeed. And we did get a couple of emails. First off, Wayne and Scott, this is CCR from Green Bay. What a change a week will do. So many great things happening for the Green Bay Packers very happy to see Malik Willis do so very well, as well as Josh Jacobs' big day on the ground. Now we turn our focus to the Tennessee Titans. But until next time, go Pack Go, bleed green and gold till dead and cold. Caleb, Kathy, and Roy Fisher in Wisconsin, thank you for your email. Who else we got there, Scott? We got a novel from Dan Dyler. Uh, he did not get a call in this week, so he uh, decided to do it. give us an email. And he says, just a quick note. To, to celebrate a Packers victory. Life happens, and it's quite busy right now. Even so, it was a glorious Sunday spent at the most magical place on earth. And no, it is not Disney World. So blessed and thankful Jill and I could bring her son and his, and his new wife to experience some of the best Wisconsin has to offer. From s'mores by the river in our Airbnb to tailgating at Lambeau and the game day experience, it was so much fun. More importantly, despite Kevin and Natalie being Colts fans, they thoroughly enjoyed themselves. We were, uh, we even were able to experience a private tour of Lambeau on Monday, as we were the only four on the legendary tour, a two-hour trip around historic Lambeau Field. It was certainly a change from what we're used to with being pass-heavy to seeing Jacobs with 32 carries. That may be the most carries by a Packers running back in decades. It was fun to see all the wrinkles LaFleur threw into the game plan, and even more fun to see the scoring, even if it was not happening often. It really felt like the second half of the game the team was coasting in and certainly made me sit up straight in my seat thinking the Colts were going to make a comeback. As I write this, I saw some unfortunate news. Marshawn Lloyd is being placed on IR. What? Jacobs will definitely be featured, uh, be the featured back uh, with that since I think Wilson is also nursing an injury. That is some unfortunate news. I don't know how I missed that. He goes on to say, well, back to the drawing board and get ready for the Tennessee Titans. Fortunate enough to be going to this game as well. Likely the last of the season. Time will tell. Might be seeing a certain someone there we all know. I'm picking a higher scoring game this go around because with the opportunistic defense we have now with five interceptions in the year, I think we'll see a pick six. Predicting another Packer victory to take our record to two and one with a twenty four to ten victory. Go pack go, Captain Pack Sparrow. Oh go. so good. Go pack go indeed. So let's get ready for Nashville. Sounds like uh Cap Captain Pack Sparrow's already ready, so the rest of us, your one and one Green Bay Packers are off to Nashville to play the 0-2 Titans Sunday, September 22nd at 12 noon Central Time. And This must be a mistake. The internet claims the Tennessee Titans lead the series eight games to six. I mean, of course, this includes the years the team was in Houston and were called the Oilers. So does that really count? I don't know. The Pack first played the Oilers in Houston November 19th, 1972 and beat them 23 to 10, not the world's highest scoring game, but a victory nonetheless. Most recent matchup was November 2022. Alas, we need to get back to our winning ways. Jordan Love, barring a miracle, likely won't be back for this game. So quarterback Malik Willis will probably be going up against his recent team. Remember, it was just a few weeks ago, August 26th to be exact, that the Packers Titans trade happened. Has any other quarterback gone up against their former team so soon after being traded? And then our kicker, Braden Narvison, also came from the Titans. Not that this game is going to have any homecoming feels to it uh, for right. those two players. But, uh, you know, we got two of their best players. So we, I think victories in our future. So it's funny you talk about like going up against your former team. Uh, this something happened this past baseball season which obviously is still going. I don't know if you saw this, but there was a, this is baseball related, I know, but it's still just, I thought <laughs> it was worth bringing up. 
Uh, I believe it is the Red Sox and, oh uh, man, I can't remember which, uh, it might have been the Rockies. Somebody that will correct me if I'm wrong, but one player, okay, so it was a, the game was delayed because it was because of rain. And so the game was delayed like a day or two later. Whoa. And in between the delay of the game, one player on one of those teams was traded to the other team. So halfway through the game, he was traded <laughs> oh. and actually played for the other team in the second half of the game. So that has to be the record for quickest turnaround to, you know, to play against your former team because it was literally the same game, even though it wasn't the same day. But uh, I thought that was worth, worth mentioning. That is amazing. Yeah, yeah. I had no clue. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. Thank you, Scott. The game between these two teams that I'd most like to see mirrored next Sunday is the one from December 23rd, 2012. We won that game 55-7. to seven. In fact, Green Bay scored the game's first 55 points before Titans quarterback Jake Locker finally completed a two-yard touchdown pass to Kenny Britt. A score like that definitely warrants a go-pack-go, would you not agree? Go-pack-go indeed. Of course I agree, Wayne. And uh, as we mentioned already, yes, I will be at the Tennessee Titans game. My wife and I are flying out on Friday, so we'll actually be in town a little bit early, going to do some... uh, See some sites. Got a. Uh, I think we're going to tour a distillery while we're down there. Um, there is a place in Nashville called uh, Broadway Brew House mm. that uh, I know I'm going to be visiting because we went there and they have a dish called brisket quesadilla that is absolutely to die for. Mm. And I got to stock up on some Puckett's barbecue sauce while I'm there. Also, Wayne, I didn't tell you this. Uh, listener David Newman is also going to the game. So I'm definitely going to have to see him and give him a big old hug as well. So lots nice. of PFP people going to be there, man. You should, I don't, you know, you got to make it out to one of these. I'm just saying. I know. I need to do just that saying. sometime. That sounds fantastic. If you get any spare time, you can work on your two stepping. <laughs> There's a lot going on down in Nashville, but it is going to be muggy and warm on game day. A 20% chance of rain in the late afternoon, 84 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about 29 degrees Celsius. So I I don't need to tell you to bundle up. That's for sure. Yeah, that is true. Well, Wayne, are you ready for some keys to a Packers victory over the Titans? Yes, I am, because I like this victory feeling. Let's keep it going. I do. I I should have put on here something about the heat, because if, uh, you know, our center is puking on the ball, Mm. uh, you know, we, we, we don't do the best under super hot weather, if you remember... New Orleans, and you remember uh, Tampa and all that kind of good stuff. So anyway, my first strategy is to expect the toughest defensive stance yet. Mm. The Titans have a great pass rush with Jeffrey Simmons and Harold Landry. It's going to be difficult to get big plays on an improved secondary with big names like Legereus Sneed, Jamal Adams, and Quandre Diggs. They also traded for Ernest Jones at middle linebacker from the Rams, and he's also quite a stud. So that being said, this isn't going to be Willis's week to shine on the passing game. In my opinion, the Packers should let Josh Jacobs and company do their thing once again. That's going to be the name of the game. Strategy number two, come out swinging early. The Titans don't do very well when they're coming from behind, so drawing first blood is going to give the Packers a massive advantage here. Get that early lead, and it should be a lot easier to maintain than in other games. Although, like, you know, with the Colts where we like almost let it slip by, uh, otherwise, this game will be uncomfortably close, like last week, uh, when we should have won by a lot more. That game, we won that game uh, on paper by much more than the score showed. And lastly, take advantage of the biggest weakness, uh, Levis. As much as we all love Brett Favre, he was one of the he was not uh, less of a fundamental quarterback than Rodgers was. He took a lot of chances that often spelled disaster and. In my opinion, Will Levis is very similarly styled quarterback, and the Packers would do well to take advantage of this. He doesn't take great care of the ball and often tries to make big plays resulting in turnovers. This is an opportunity for our secondary to continue to take advantage and keep the ball with the right team. Let's get those seven interceptions in week three yeah. that we had all last season. There's going to be plenty of opportunities because uh, the Titans are very much a long possession team with a good defense. So the name of the game here is going to be turning over the ball quickly to give the offense as many opportunities to run the ball and get that score up as much as possible. And there you have it, Wayne. What do you think? That is good stuff, Scott. Be sure to bring those keys to victory with you 
to Nashville. And if you bump into Matt LaFleur, uh, make sure he remembers that you've shared these and that they are ready to go. Will do, man. All right, moving on to our 2024 season wager of fun. Last week, I had predicted that Green Bay would win 21 to 17. Wayne predicted 17 to 14 in favor of Green Bay. Uh, the final score was 16 to 10 with the Packers winning. That gave me a total differential of 12 points and Wayne a differential of only five points. Well done, sir. Look at that. The official first win of the season. As far as the PFP listeners, the closest was going to be Brett Connor. He also guessed 17 to 14, same differential as you. So uh, you and he are both the leaders. You're the leader between you and me, and Brett is the leader over all of the other uh, Packers fan podcast listeners who wrote in with their guesses. Very nice. This week, I, I'm going on the fly on this one because I did not have a score. I know. Uh, I was wondering why you were keeping it a secret. I it wasn't Still intentional. <laughs> uh, I tried to I tried to prepare ahead of time and somehow glossed over this one. But I think that uh, I, I think Green Bay will win this game. Uh, but I think it's going to be a little bit tighter. I'm going to say I'm going to say 17-16 Green Bay. 17-16, because I think it's going to be a big turnover game, so there's not going to be as much time for uh, for scores to happen. So, yeah, 17-16 in favor of Green Bay. Wow. Our picks for week three from our listeners, Jay Walter says Green Bay 22-17. Garrett Stritzel 20-14 to in favor of Green Bay. Uh, Dogger Del Tour, Green Bay 24, Nashville 17. Dan Dyler, Green Bay 24, Nashville 10. I'm going to let you take over, man. I've been talking a lot. Oh, that's all right. And would you like to hear my guess for the game? No, no, because it's not going to matter. I'm going to get it. Oh, okay. Well, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Again, mine was 17, 16. (laughs) What's your guess? I'm going to go with Packers win 20 to 17. And then uh, Brett Connor went with uh, Green Bay 21, Nashville 17. And Megan went with Green Bay 24, Nashville 20. There you have it. This is the third time in a row. Everybody's calling for a Packers victory. I'm loving the optimism. NFC North, we've got the Minnesota Vikings at 2-0, and which sucks. It stinks that they're 2-0, and but at least it came at the expense of Frisco. Yeah, if you're going to be anybody, if it's going to be anybody, let it be Frisco. But, uh, you know, more for division's sake, I, I was kind of cheering on San Francisco. Yeah, and the Packers are 1-1, one and one, the Lions are 1-1, one and, one, and the Bears are 1-1. One and, one. and I got to tell the listeners once again, Wayne puts these on this document each week, right? And even though the Packers are technically, technically in last place because, you know, Lions, Bears, and Packers all have one and one, but according to stats and points for and points against and all that, the Packers are technically in last place. When Wayne put this on the document, he put the Packers just in second place. Duh. (laughs) I mean, haven't you noticed we've been sharing our culture with you all day? (laughs) Let's talk about some other NFL happenings that caught our eye this week. There were uh, is was an impressive pass play in the Niners Vikings game. Sam Darnold threw from his own end zone to Jeff, Justin Jefferson at the fifty yard line, who ran it all the way to the end zone. Wound up being a ninety seven yard passing touchdown. Wasn't without a cost, however, as Jefferson left the game with a quadriceps injury. So, not a big fan of the Vikings, obviously, but I do not wish ill will on any players, and I wish him a speedy recovery. Also, Alvin Kamara. Had a fantastic day against the Cowboys. The Saints running backs scored four touchdowns. One was a 57-yard screen pass. The Saints won that game 44-19. to The, the uh, Cowboys are... I haven't seen any more memes about any other team than the Cowboys so far after these first two weeks of <laughs> NFL football. But uh, maybe, it, maybe next year. And it actually goes back to uh, the playoffs last year when we had a fantastic day against the Cowboys. Yes. And other than that game, there were so many low scoring games and so many upsets. And I need to get a handle on picking the other NFL games pretty darn soon before my pick 'em league goes down in flames. I mean, how on earth are the Ravens winless? <laughs> I don't understand. But uh, I know it's only been two weeks, but in the PFP Fantasy Football League, I'm currently in first place. Nice. My fantasy leagues this year are. Uh... Not good. It's not good. Uh, before we head out of here, I want to remind everybody about my other podcast, The Gaming Outsider. We've got a new episode out this Thursday where we are talking about 3D platformers, not just the Mario ones. 
uh, especially some hidden gems that we've played over the years. You can hear my show at the same places you listen to this one, and you can find our website at thegamingoutsider.com. Also, please consider coming out to Rockford, Illinois for R2V2 on Saturday and Sunday, October 12th and 13th. Uh, I had some really cool news. Wayne, I didn't even tell you this. Grant Henry, who goes by the stage name of Stemage, uh, he's a guitarist, super cool guy. He is headlining our after party. I told you we're having live music. He just revealed this past week that he landed a pretty impressive gig. He has provided all the sounds and music for Jersey Jack's latest physical pinball table based on the Avatar movies by James Cameron. There is an 18-minute promo video that he's in hair and makeup and the you know, professional, all this kind of stuff talking about this table. Wayne, I got I remind me, I will share the link with you. Yes. This please. thing looks like one of the coolest pinball tables I've seen in a long time. And I know I'm a little biased because a good buddy of mine has done all the music and sound for but it, still. but, and he's going to be headlining the show. Like, like he's, th- this is a guy that's going to be at my thing. I just, I just feel like the luckiest guy in the world. So uh, please check it out. If you get a chance, you can find more details at thegamingoutsider.com forward slash R2V2. Thanks again for using Patreon to help support the PFP. If you'd like to financially support the show through Patreon, check out the details at PackersFanPodcast.com forward slash give back. Go Paco, and thank you to our inaugural Bart Star Legendary Level Patreon Pledge, Jay Walters. Dan Dyler getting inspired by Jordan Love with his $10 monthly support. Go Paco, and thank you. Really do appreciate it. Absolutely we do. And coming in hot, helping out the PFP at the Brett Favre level, Scott Boers. Megan and Miguel Ramirez from the Opposites Attract podcast. Thanks and go pack go to all of you as well. Also, our Curly Lambo level supporters got their own go pack goes and thank yous. Hank Davis from the TPE Network, Brett Connor and Joe Christensen. And if you're interested in joining in, all the details are PackersFanPodcast.com slash give back. And a quick reminder, unofficial Packers Fan Podcast is not affiliated with the NFL or the Green Bay Packers. But even better than that would be would be if you tell a friend or two or ten at work, at the store, or even at the stoplight, roll down your window and say, hey, listen to the Packers Fan Podcast, the show by and for fans of your 13-time NFL champion Green Bay Packers. Also, you can follow us on the social media outlet formerly known as Twitter, at Packers Fan Pod, or if you'd like to follow me personally, it is at GoCast Scott, or if you'd like to follow the Gaming Outsider, it is at the GoCast. And Wayne's handle is at Wayne Henderson. And since we're on to Nashville, here's our PFP Go Pack Go outro from community members Andre, Joe Christensen, Megan, and Dan Dollar to get us in the mood for victory. Go Pack Go! Go Pack Go! Go Pack Go! Go, 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 go